Hey guys, and welcome to the Performance Hub podcast, and thanks for tuning in. So before we get started, we want to let you guys know about an amazing offer we have going at the moment. Using the coupon code COMMUNITY, we have one month's free access to the Performance Hub. So this is our online member site where we have tons of content from in-depth exercise tutorials, videos on different strength and conditioning methods, program templates, articles on nutrition, stress management, and just a ton more content. So head over to www.pipeperformance.uk to sign up and get started on that today. As well as that, below this video, we've linked all our social media channels, as well as all of our guest socials. So go and like and comment and share as it really helps us to be able to produce more content for you guys, like the interview that we have today. Okay, so that's enough of that. Let's dive into today's interview and see what it's all about. Let's do it. Okay, guys, welcome to the uh, Performance Hub podcast. So today we've got with us Johnny Ty, a good friend of mine and the COO and Managing Director of Precision Hydration and we're going to be talking all things hydration today. How you doing Johnny, you alright? Lovely day? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a lovely day here. Um, pleased to be joining mate, it's, it's been all a while right. since we've connected, I don't think we've ever had a video call, so this is a change of no. connection for us. <laughs> it's, it's a new world, it's a brave new world of video yeah. It's good, but look. Today, obviously, we want to talk about hydration, but before we kind of get into that, do you want to just let people know a bit about you and how you got to where you're at and your background in sports and things? Yeah, for sure. So uh, my background is sport. Um, I was a canoeist. I say was. I haven't paddled seriously for probably five years now, um, but I raced for the British team in sprint and marathon kayaking for around about 10 years, really, from quite a young age. Um, my mum and dad were pretty sporty. My dad is a canoeist and that's the sort of pathway I took with sport was following in his footsteps. I remember one boxing day, um, he asked what, what I wanted to do that day. And we'd been out paddling, um, before Christmas and that, that was basically it from then. I just cracked on and you loved it. Have. So I got sort of more and more drawn into that sport, but I did at an early age, I played a lot of cricket and, and, uh, rugby at school but then sort of more and more um, got specialist in, in that sport and then I went to to university and, and carried on my sport sort of sport there I studied engineering at University of Surrey which is actually how we we met mm-hmm. um, and that's kind of where things started to change a bit for me I'd been quite successful as a junior canoeist um, and things really get quite real when you move out of the under 18 categories up to under 23s and, and into senior level it's it's a whole new world of, mm. of competition then. Um, and I was faced with that kind of natural point where I was either going to sort of double down on my efforts in, in sport and try and become a, a serious professional athlete, um, which I was c- quite keen to do. But I was also very keen on not um, shutting down any kind of a- academic pathways I was working on. So I, was, I, I did mechanical engineering at university, as I said. Um, and I sort of realised pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be good enough to go to the Olympic Games, which was sort of everyone's aspirational dream as, mm. as an athlete. And was was very lucky to um, kind of pivot out of my sport and, and throw all my energy into business, um, which is where I'm at now. So um, I met my, my now business partner, Andy Blow, um, in about 2009-10. Um, and he started Precision Hydration uh, in 2011 and I was involved with him from, from the, the beginning of, of this company um, but it wasn't until much later when I finished university and um, we sort of restructured the business and, and dove in both of us with two feet there's not a lot of idea of, of what we we're doing uh, <laughs> and kind of and gradually tried to figure it out and that's uh, sort of where we are now I guess in a in a sh- very short plotted history. Yeah and you guys are, I mean you seem to be doing great you know getting involved in so many different sports um you know a lot of endurance sports obviously but i know you've done sweat testing with like mma fighters and things like that so kind of broadening your you know uh the the amount of different areas that you're covering yeah i mean it's sort of the great thing about hydration is it's it's a very wide field um and we've chosen to be very specific in that field so um until this point at least we we only work in hydration um a little we delve a little bit into fueling because the two tie in so closely but 
anybody who sweats can be um, can sort of utilize our services and, and expertise. You know, some of, I've worked with professional sheep shearers in New Zealand to <laughs> miners to NFL players, uh, NBA players, Premier League footballers. We do some really interesting things, and that's it is probably the best part of of our job is to really get into the individual situation of different people's um or you know what they're up to and really interrogate what their actual requirements are and tailor what what they need so um that's really what we do actually is individualized hydration and yeah. so really like what we're going to talk, be talking about today isn't just for sports people or people who like to train and work out you know if you're a, a manual worker if you're you know physical you use your hands and you're maybe outside or you know your job is quite demanding in physically then there's going to be potentially an application for or there's going to be more need to make sure your hydration is is you know appropriate and optimal yeah for sure i mean it yes and no i would say i think we'll also talk about some situations where it's not appropriate to supplement with sports drinks or electrolytes because i do think there are certain people in certain situations who do overuse the sorts of things that we um, offer. However, you're absolutely right. It's not just about your hardcore athlete who's out sweating day in, day out training. We've got um, people who fit roofs in Texas or people who work on uh, railway tracks in Australia or, you know, with the kind of weather that, that's uh, predicted in the UK for the foreseeable, you could be Doing, doing any manual labour in South Sea and needing a lot of uh, hydration <laughs> supplementation. So, um, yeah, it's, it's basically anybody who sweats for a prolonged period of time may need to look at some additional supplementation, depending on their physiology, um, to make sure you stay on top of, of your losses. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so what, we'll come back to who doesn't need to use that later, because I think that would be an interesting one to look at, because... Um, you're right, there are definitely people who probably overuse sports drinks and things like that, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's just start off just by going over what hydration really is, you know, just to let, lay that as a, the groundwork that we can build on later. But what is hydration? Let's, let's start by talking about sweat, because sweat's a great place to start with hydration. Um, so when, when we sweat, you don't just sweat out water. Um, now, well, the reason we sweat, let's start with that. So the reason you sweat is to regulate core body temperature. And your body has to regulate that relatively tightly to um, function optimally on on ongoing. So if you exercise, which is largely the, the use case that we're talking about, um, as a byproduct of that um, exercise, you're going to create, generate heat in the body. And so to dissipate that, we as humans sweat. So you, you perspire. Um, fluid onto the skin that evaporates and it takes heat with it keeping the body the body cool now that is an exceptionally efficient cooling mechanism um, when you compare it to others like for instance you might see your dog sitting in the shade at the moment panting aggressively trying to dissipate heat and it's it's far less efficient than than sweat sweating um, and that that gave us looking right back in in into sort of where we've come from that gave us an advantage as hunters in the, the African savannah, if we could, we could keep moving continuously and sweat in, in the, the, the dry heat of, of Africa, and um, some of the prey we'd be hunting down would have to they'd go off a lot faster, but they'd have to stop and call in the shade, like, like your dogs. And, and over time, the tales have been told that we could just track these animals, keep sweating, keep moving, and, and eventually just, just basically pick them up because you've, they've, they've had it with heat exhaustion. Yeah. So that's kind of how we've evolved um, to sweat. But the, the downside to sweating is, is that we have to hydrate to some extent at some point. Um, and so we need to take on fluid and in some case some electrolytes to make sure we're staying on top of those losses to keep performing optimally um, you know, in, in the endurance space as an athlete. Yeah. Mm. So it's not just like hydration is slightly more than just taking on water like how much how wh where's the balance between you know the water that we drink out of a tap or out of a bottle and then adding in some kind of electrolyte sub um you know supplementation good question so again let's let's talk go back to sweat so 
everyone sweats very, very differently. Um, so if you saw me after working out in, in a hot environment, I was just a sweaty mess. There was a puddle of fluid under my workstation and it's horrid. And we all know that person that you've been to the gym with who basically doesn't look like they've done anything. You know, yeah. just, they've got the glow on and then, and then gone home. Um, so it's, it's pretty obvious with certain people that you can, you can see some people sweat a huge amount of volume and some people don't sweat a lot of volume at all. That's, that's visible. You can see the difference in fluid loss. Now, the space that we're particularly interested in is, is the electrolyte content someone sweats. So, again, it's very, very individual. You could lose as little as about 200 or 250 milligrams of sodium for every litre of fluid you sweat, or up close to 2,000 milligrams of sodium. So, you're talking about 10, 11 fold variance in the concentration of electrolytes that an individual might lose. Mm. So, when when um you know generally i'm i've actually i've done a bit of fizz this morning but it wasn't particularly strenuous and so i've just been drinking water today and i'll get some additional sodium from my diet and i don't need to go nuts with drinking a lot of electrolytes but certainly at the level of volume sweat i lose and the concentration of sweat that, that i lose i would definitely if i was working very hard in the heat for a long period of time be leaning on some electrolyte supplementation to make sure I was staying on top of those losses. But mm -hmm. it's not something you need to rely on on a day-to-day -day basis because naturally the Western diet is, is relatively salty. And um, you know, the, the amount of electrolytes and fluid you're losing if you're not doing anything particularly uh, savage is, is not gonna be detrimental to performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So day-to-day, unless we're introducing an activity that's going to make us sweat a lot and we're potentially working hard in different capacities, we're probably going to have enough electrolyte to keep us going, electrolyte to keep us going, but the water would be, well, you know, if we're not doing, if we're not exercising very hard, why do we even need to drink water throughout the day? So you, you're going to lose fluid through just um, breathing and talking. And so the body has a requirement to take on some fluid to, to stay on top of that. And, your, the main mechanism to uh, inform you as to when to, to pick up fluids is, is your thirst drive. And the, the body is in, incredibly good at um, giving you a nudge when you need to have a drink. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting point, actually, because if we, if we take a moment to, to look back at how some, hi, some hydration advice has changed over the last 100 years or so, um, as in a lot of... Um, kind of, I guess, technological advances and things in sport with Garmin's and a lot more data available. We've become far less in tune with what our bodies are telling us to do and more yeah. reliant on those things that are around us yeah. um, and the messages that we're pushed, um, I would say. So, you know, if you look back to some of the kind of really early ultra trail runners um, that were around 100 years ago, um, they would talk about not needing to drink at all. Um, and, and the, the, the fact that they were, they were pushing, um, not needing a lot of fluid to get around these, these pretty serious um, running events. And then um, you, could, you could fast forward then, at, let's say to, uh, actually even around the time of someone like, someone's famous as um, Tommy Simpson, the, the cyclist who famously died on the Tour de France. He was famed for only drinking four small bottles through the, the stage of the Tour de France. And they, they would have been, 250 milliliter bottles yeah. probably with the odd one with a bit of brandy in it at, at those times. <laughs> so it was, you know, sort of frowned upon to be drinking a lot of drinks then because it was, it, you were seen as weak if you needed it. Okay. Um, but then you, you get to the era of, of some of the big giants in the sports, sports drinks industry, the Gatorades of the world coming into play in, in the nineties and some of the marketing messages that were pushed by them. Um, saw a huge increase in the amount of um, fluid that was being taken on um, during exercise. And they were, they were suggesting that you should drink around 40 fluid ounces per hour, which is a litre and a half per hour of endurance exercise wow. um, where possible, which is a lot of fluid. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you've got any endurance athletes listening to this, if, you've, if you're able to drink a litre and a half of fluid for a prolonged period of time whilst working pretty hard, that is impressive. And in actually in a lot of cases it's quite dangerous mm. um so there was this big pendulum swing in advice from like 
don't bother drinking at all to effectively drink as much as you can because otherwise you're going to you're going to see a drop off in your performance obviously with the motive that they're selling sports drinks which should be um noted at this point mm. um and then there was a, a really interesting um spike in cases of hyponatremia which is also worth us diving into a little bit today Hyper or hypo. hypo right so hyponatremia means low blood sodium levels mm. and so the the biggest cause for hyponatremia is is literally over drinking so you can you can effectively dilute your system by drinking lots and lots and lots of fluid mm -hmm. and so when this advice started coming out from the american college of sports medicine and gatorade and, and some of the some of the kind of commercial entities that were entering the market at that point um there was a spike in in or there were more reported cases of hyponatremia in, in endurance events and so um basically the advice sort of swung back the other way a little bit um and the acsm um revised their guidelines i can't remember when exactly it was but to um effectively drink to thirst um where 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 possible um after this sort of increase in people over drinking and the prevalence of the sports drink so i think where kind of precision hydration come into the conversation is that there is no one size fits all with advice in terms of what to drink and how much to drink it's all about appropriate use of fluids and or electrolytes um, around different activities in different environments of different lengths mm. um, but you're absolutely right coming back to your your point you know generally day to day we don't need to be nailing sports drinks unless unless you're you know working really quite hard and, and sweating quite a lot because you're going to get a reasonable amount of electrolytes from your diet and can can take in enough fluid from from the drinks that we drink during the day so i one of the things that i've previously used as a guide with clients is that we could probably say that every calorie that someone burns throughout the day, they, if they consumed a millimeter of water, a mill of water, that that would probably cover it. So if they're burning, say, 3,000 calories a day or whatever, and that, oh, that's what they're eating at maintenance, then yeah. if they've drunk three liters of water, it'd probably be enough to keep them hydrated. Would you say that would be about right, or are there other considerations? It's a good question. I've never pegged it to calories, actually, and, and, and workload in that way. Um, so I wouldn't comment specifically on that, but I think having guardrails for um, athletes who are not sort of some more amateur athletes who aren't necessarily as experienced as listening to when they're thirsty and, and, yeah. and responding to what their body needs, having guardrails in place like that that they can operate around is a very sensible thing to do. Mm. What I certainly have a um, an issue with is when um, coaches or companies dictate. Um, you know what people should be drinking a day because that that is very rarely correct you know this blanket kind of we should all be drinking two liters of water a day that was is, the old advice from the government wasn't it two liters of water across the board yeah it's very arbitrary and the same same goes with, with calories you know you you'll know that um in it you know in far greater detail than me henry but if if everyone just stuck to the the kind of um guidelines for calorific intake then you know guys who are a lot bigger who are working a lot harder and burn a lot more calories would be in big trouble so it's very individual yeah i got yeah. girls who would be in a big trouble if they stuck to the government guidelines on calorie <laughs> consumption <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, i've got one girl who's eating double probably the, the government guidelines yeah and, yeah, yeah. It's so it's so individualized isn't it yeah and that's 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 part of the i guess the wider problem is that there's the whole um industry is a big maze of smoke and mirrors for the for the for the consumer out there because you don't know what is what the correct advice is you know mm -hmm. if it's being pushed out by the government that you should eat x amount of calories and drink this amount of fluid a day then surely that's correct you know and then uh, another one one entity will say do this and the other will say do something completely different and it's such a confusing space to be in and that's where you know having a coach like yourself who, who interrogates those things and pulls the bits of information that are relevant to that individual to, together can be quite useful if you're not somebody who's sort of really on the ball, I guess. So going back to that kind of intuitive 
kind of understanding of when you need to drink, recognizing your thirst cues, let's call it that. What, what would that, what would people, should people look out for in terms of recognizing thirst cues and when to hydrate if they wanted to get a bit more intuitive, a bit more aware and stop relying on kind of yeah. Um, technology? Yeah, I think practice is, is the key and just being, trying to practice being really self-aware when you're sweating a lot. So in those sessions where um, you're training really quite hard and you know that you're going to be losing a lot of fluid and electrolytes then rather than just kind of blindly necking your bottle down because you, you know it's going to do some good just wait and, and listen to what your body is is saying so if for instance we were talking about uh, just before we dove on here you, you've been getting out on the bike a little bit and so have I and it's been interesting to do a bit more of that because um, you know I've noticed where I've been out on some rides and it's been a little bit warmer. I've slightly undercooked my, my, my drinks and mm. basically I just get a drier mouth and I'm like ready for a drink. It's, yeah. it's pretty, pretty simple stuff, but it, um, you, if, if you really get in tune with it, your taste will also change. So okay. you'll know that at times you really crave like sugary things and because your body is demanding the, the, the um, fuel to, to, to get you through, but also at times, when you drink your electrolytes or if you have a really strong electrolyte drink it, it might taste really salty and that might be because you've actually got enough electrolytes at, at that point and your body's just just craving the fluid conversely at the end of a really long ride or you know i put a new fence up in the garden um at the weekend and you're expensive like a beast yeah and all i all i wanted in the afternoon was like salty crisps and yeah. that was my body just in peanuts and stuff and that is your body craving that that salty um, salt replacement. So yeah, just yeah, kind of put, putting two and two together is is the kind of the, the knack and not just thinking, oh yeah, I'm about Chris. Is it, why, why is that? Um, and, and gluing, stitching the two things together. And then you can become more aware on the fly as you, you're racing or, or doing something where, you know, you've got to keep, keep on the ball to keep performing optimally. Mm -hmm. So. I wonder yeah. if there's a correlation between people who always crave salty food, you know, and their and a higher kind of salt uh, sodium loss in their sweat. Yeah. I would I would almost yes, I would definitely say we've seen that kind of subjectively. Um, so what we what we do at Precision Hydration is we sweat test athletes to understand what their electrolyte loss is like in sweat. So we do, it's, it's actually a non-exercise sweat test. So you just sit down in a chair, we put a couple of electrodes on your forearm to make you sweat on a little two pence piece size area of your arm. You then, we put a collector on that spot. So you sweat, sweat into the collector and then we run that through an analyzer and that tells us how much sodium you're losing per liter of sweat. It gives us a concentration output. So I lose around 1300 milligrams of sodium per liter. Andy, my business partner who started precision hydration loses about 1900 milligrams of sodium per liter and has a savage sweat rate quite a difference it's a huge difference and i'm i'm on the higher end for mm. sure he's he's exceptionally high would you see so, that someone would literally just sweat higher volumes or is it perhaps maybe they don't sweat more but just the concentration of sodium is in correct the so you see all all variants so you kind of the, the most interesting cases for us are people like Andy with a really high sweat volume and a really high um, sweat concentration because you got kind of worse of both worlds there. You lose yeah, yeah. that fluid and the most amount of sodium. Now, he actually has a very efficient cooling mechanism because he, he, can, he can dissipate a lot of heat because he's getting rid of a, a lot of fluid. So that's the kind of pr plus side of where he's at. Mm -hmm. the, conversely, we also see people who have like, tiny sweat rates they mm. don't lose a lot of fluid at all and they don't lose a lot of salt mm. now you think well that's great from our perspective because they, they don't need to drink too much and they don't need to replace any salt but also they come against challenges when they're racing in the heat to actually dissipate heat so yeah, yeah. you have to work with them to work to look at different ways for them to to stay cool and um throwing water over the head and different types of clothing and kit to make sure that you're not just overheating and having to back off your pace to cool down because that is the only way you're going to get yeah. out of it is by backing off your pace. That's so interesting. So, I, I'm thinking of a client of mine who runs frequently 
and doesn't do well in the heat, but actually, yeah, you're right, doesn't really sweat that much. And it's yeah. an interesting so heat, kind of heat could be for, a challenge it? there. Yeah. But I mean, so sweat concentration is largely genetically determined. So you're not going to you're not going to move too much. I lose about 1300 yeah. milligrams of sodium per liter. That's pretty much where I'm at. Yeah. Um, so you're not going to move from somebody who's 200 milligrams to 1500 milligrams. You, you, not trainable. In that place, yeah. Um, sweat volume is going to vary a bit more depending on how hard you're working, the environment yeah. you're in, and all of those kind of variables. Um, but like you say, gluing those two things together that are individual um, is is the magic, um, mm -hmm. really, in understanding somebody's net fluid and sodium loss. So if someone doesn't have access to sweat testing, what things yeah. could they look out for to kind of get an idea whether they're... I mean, it's going to be easy to work out whether you sweat a lot, isn't it? Because you're going to yeah. be covered in sweat all the time. What yeah. would people would look out for to find out whether they've got like a high um, concentration of sodium in their sweat? So with, with the sodium, I would, first of all, see whether you're getting any salt crystals on your, fa on your face or kit after long bouts of training. Um, you could look at uh, whether you're regularly finishing training with that salt craving that I talked about earlier. That could, could be an indicator. Um, and it, potentially, I mean, it worked. I think we, when we first met Henry seven or eight years ago, you were getting some cramping, weren't you? Jiu Jitsu, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes, if you're getting cramp late on in, in exercise where you've been sweating quite a bit, um, electrolyte depletion can be the, the cause of cramp. So just putting some, you know, a decent level of supplementation in, it's pretty, pretty binary. It'll either work or it won't. And mm -hmm. so, those are kind of telltale signs that you might have a higher concentration. And on, on the sweat volume thing, I'd, I'd certainly urge people to put a, uh, put a bit of data behind how much fluid they're losing because it's so easy to do. Okay. You need yeah. a set of bathroom scales and weigh yourself beforehand, weigh yourself afterwards, taking into account anything you've drunk or peed during that time. Mm -hmm. And you should get a pretty, a pretty good idea of what fluid you're losing. Every kilo you lose is, is a litre of fluid. So um, if you spreadsheet that out, you'll definitely want to get some repeats in similar environments. You can yep. build up a, an idea of where you're at. But if you wanted to know how much fluid you're losing through a, a, a long jiu-jitsu session, then you just do take some, take some data repeats and look at how much you're losing. And you might be surprised. Yeah, that's super interesting. So super drying interesting. yourself off after your session, obviously take your gear off or whatever you're wearing for your session, weigh yourself. And I guess looking at like the time that you trained, how much you've lost, what yeah. you consumed and working out your exact losses per hour, it'd be a good way. So could you develop a hydration strategy based on, on the losses then? Yeah, to some extent. So very quickly, there's a blog on our website, actually, precisionhydration.com, that talks through exactly how to do that with a spreadsheet oh, you download, you can bang your data into it. Um, so if you want to do some home testing, that's a really good way, place to start. Mm. Um, and yes, to some extent, you can use that to help develop a framework for what you're going to do. Um, but it's got to be fluid. It can't be a pardon the pun there. Um, you can't. You can't. Um, you know, say say you found that you're losing about a liter an hour. You don't therefore need to be drinking a liter an hour. You, you're not going to be aiming to replace a hundred percent of your losses okay. during that bout of exercise. Um, you're not going to be able to do it for a start, but. You, you don't want to aim to do that. It's, it's very difficult to put a, a number on how much dehydration you can tolerate before um, your performance starts to suffer. Yeah. And that's quite an individual element of the game too, because a lot of the, the older studies that you might have heard that the, the famous marketing strap line, lose 2% of your body weight, lose 20% of your performance. Yeah. 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 You see it in a lot of gyms. That's it. And that's, that's not necessarily true for sure. You know, we've seen athletes who lose 10, 11, 12% of their body weight and are still smashing out, um, you know, fastest time, fastest ma uh, mile times in, in, in the marathon. Mm -hmm. Um, at that point, that's definitely not to say that, that everyone can deal with that. I'd say that's more of an outlier case, but certainly we see athletes losing four five, six percent of body weight and still being able to perform well, um, with, you know, under that, element of that that level of dehydration mm -hmm. um 
but it's it is individual so some people will start to suffer at two percent that's that's for sure so yeah. you can look at your volume loss and you're probably going to be looking to replace in the region of 50 to 70 percent of that fluid volume depending on what you're doing how long for um uh, you know as part of your hydration strategy yeah mm. So going so okay so that so that's a that's from a performance perspective. Let's I don't you I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but you mentioned earlier about people who shouldn't be perhaps or maybe over consume sports drinks. And yeah. one one kind of category of people that came into my mind is people trying to lose weight, people going in the gym doing you know cardiovascular exercise or whatever it might be. Let's say they're doing low intensity cardiovascular exercise, but they're downing sports drinks on the uh, treadmill and now we know you know calorie wise you're probably undoing some of the work that you've been doing but would there be like a kind of hydration component to that would you say that they might you know could do with just maybe allowing well, some really of that for the, not for the weight loss per se i wouldn't i wouldn't say but i definitely would agree with you that um the kind of most of your off-the-shelf sports drinks contain a lot of sugar um which is your which is your biggest enemy in, in that game when you're trying to lose is body fat um and like i said right at the start of this conversation unless you're working really quite hard for quite a long period of time you don't need to be necking lots of electrolyte drinks some water would be would be absolutely fine and you can you can top yourself up afterwards with some additional fluid and some additional salt on your food mm -hmm. um but it's it's an interesting point because let's take let's take a 10k run for instance if i was going to go and run 10k this evening i probably certainly wouldn't take any electrolytes with me because i'm probably not going to go training tomorrow morning yes I've, I've sweat quite a bit while i'm out there but i'll have dinner this evening with a bit of a bit of salt on it and that would be fine for me in terms of what i need to replace however if i was um you know training 15 16 17 hours a week and i train this morning and i've got another session tomorrow i've got to back this up quite quickly then certainly you might want to consider having some supplementation around that bout of exercise so you have to kind of put it in context or the individual session in context with the the picture that that the athlete is um sort of trying to perform on so with somebody who's trying to lose a bit of weight and maybe only training three or four times a week you're your stepwise depletion because of back-to-back -back training sessions is going to be relatively negligible and unless those training sessions are you know an hour plus uh i would suggest you, you should be okay most of the time without without electrolyte drinks um unless you've got particularly high salt loss or particularly high volume loss you know um which in which case you might want to have a have a look at it so but in most situations you don't need to go nuts for it unless you're you're sweating quite a lot. And but because and water will just cover you, you know. A normal yeah, of nice. water, maybe yeah. consuming slightly more on days that you do exercise, you know, compared to non exercise. Exactly, and naturally you'll find that you'll do that because your thirst drive and, and your body's cues are so good. So yeah, yeah. if you if you actually tracked without sort of you'd have to do it blind. But if you tracked what you drank on training days and on non-training days, you'd find those levels would, would um, increase and decrease according to your losses to some extent, for sure. Does it matter if, you're, if you kind of drink the water very quickly? So I, I, if I think about jiu-jitsu, for example, we might you know, do our skill work and then we would be looking to um, spar at the end. So it might be half an hour to an hour of sparring. And every five minutes, we're going to have like a minute break. And so sometimes I'm, I'm going to be like slugging down water in that minute. Um, yeah. Other time, you know, but whereas in other activities, I might be regularly sipping water. Is there any difference in terms of how you're going to simulate that and take it in and ultimately get optimal hydration? Yeah, to some extent, I'd say so. So if we took two uh, really extreme examples, so your, yours is in there too, but if we looked at um, a road cyclist, who has a bottle between his legs 24 seven. And right. if you're at a really high level, you might have a mate in a car behind you, like throwing more bottles at you. It's super easy, always got fluid available. And so it's, it's super easy logistically. And um, you can really nail down exactly what you, you want in those bottles. Mm. Now at the other end of the spectrum, you might have um, a long distance open water swimmer with a support boat who feeds, every uh 
period of time and yeah, at that yeah. point exactly what you've just described they've got to get a load of calories in and a load of fluid in at that point so what you might look to do with with your swimmer who's not able to drink as often and um it, it is increase the electrolyte content a little bit to help them retain that fluid and increase the absorption rate through the gut a little bit mm. um to make sure you're utilizing that fluid um when you've got um, fluid on, on demand in, in scenario A on, on the bike, um, you've got a bit more flexibility basically and can sit as and when you need it and it's, it's a lot easier to handle. But yeah, I'd, I'd maybe just taper up the, the concentration of electrolytes a little bit because your overall intake of fluid is going to be less and you're going to be plugging it a lot, a lot, a lot more. So we've, I know on your website I've looked and they give you kind of recommendations of like kind of preloading uh, during yeah. exercise and post. What, do you want to just explain a bit about the different hydration strategies in terms of when we're consuming it and how it's going to impact on our performance? Yeah, of course. So for most people, as, as we said earlier, it's, it's, um, you, you've got to come to us to have a sweat test at one of our test centres in the UK or, or in the US or in Australia, for instance. Um, so it's, it might not be practical for you to come and have a sweat test with us. So we have an online sweat test, which is free. You can run through it if, if you're interested at, um, on our website. And that will give you a, uh, a sport specific um, hydration plan based on the information you give us. So we ask questions about your sweat volume, your perceived saltiness, um, what sport you're doing, how long you do it for, the environments you're doing these things in. And we can pull that information together we ask those questions of anyone who does our proper sweat test as well. And over the last 10 years or so, I've developed an algorithm that's, that, that learns and um, can point you to where roughly we think you need to be from a, an electrolyte um, replacement standpoint. Because what we do is a, as a precision hydration is, like I said, we sweat test people to understand their level of salt loss and then um, offer a different strength electrolyte drink depending on, on your, your losses. It's a bit like... It's a bit like t-shirt sizes. We do it a small, a medium, a large, and an extra large in drink strengths. You know, and, and, and the, the idea of the test is to, is to see whether you're a small, medium, large, or extra large, and you, you then um, have the right strength for you. Mm. So once you do the test, um, you, you might get a recommendation. So in your case, you got a recommendation to preload with some electrolytes. And um, in some, some situations, it's, it's a really um, useful strategy to, to draw upon to make sure you're starting events really well hydrated. Yeah. So a couple of good examples would be runners who it's no, notoriously a real pain to take any fluid with you if you're not running for that long, but you know it's going to be hot and you're going to be running for a period of t a long period of time. Um, another one might be in, in the case you described earlier where you're going to do this, you know, you know you're not going to be able to drink a lot. You've had a really busy day at work and you've not really stayed on top of your fluids through the day and you're kind of a little bit behind. Then you, you preload before you go to kind of bring yourself up and make sure you start in a good place. Mm -hmm. And the way would to that, so, Would that work? So say if you're if you look at the mills of water that you've drunk, if even if you're if you're going into your session, say you've only drunk a litre of water and it's an evening session, so you're probably under really what you should have drunk that day. Um, but if you're adding in some um, electrolyte supplementation would that kind of buffer the lack of fluids like literal fluid it can so you, you need fluid with your electrolytes for sure but a, a higher salt concentration will re rehydrate you more quickly basically um, so if you the reason so in your preloading strategy that we outline in your plan it would have said to use the 1500 uh, milligram per litre strength that we offer which is the strongest drink we do and you'd have one of those about an hour in, in 500 mil, that is one of those about an hour to 90 minutes before you start your training session or race. Because most of us start training dehydrated. And some of the time, it's, it's not too much of an issue. You don't need to preload before every training session. You're um, warming up and things like that. It's not going to be the end of the world, is it? Yeah, you don't need to be you don't need to preload before every session, but if you've got really key sessions in the week that you want to get right, or you're rolling into a race or a time trial or something, you certainly want to be turning up absolutely on point for that session. Right. So you preload before you go. Mm -hmm. um, so 60 to 90 minutes before 500 ml of the 1500 strength drink, and that will 
um, the extra sodium will, and fluid will move into your bloodstream, elevate blood plasma volume, which is the, 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 the goal of that, and mean that you start in a very well hydrated state. Mm. And then, so from, from, if you look at it from an endurance standpoint, if, you, if you're talking to somebody who's doing um, an Ironman or, or a marathon, wherever you kind of start in terms of your total body fluid and electrolyte levels, you're going to be gradually depleting through, through the day because you're never going to keep up with your losses, as we said earlier. So starting sort of uh, with, with more in the tank gives you a bit more to draw upon later on when, when you perhaps start to suffer. So preloading is the number one easy top tip to throw into, into your routine. Yeah. And then the, the, the only thing I would say to that is that um, preloading with electrolytes and fluid is, is not like a carbohydrate load. You can't do it for, for three or four days before a race and expect to, to be really topped up in fluid. So okay. your body will normalize very quickly. So don't, don't be smashing lots of fluid and electrolytes in, in the run up to a, a big event thinking you can do yourself a, a big favor. Mm. It is that short term load on a race day. You might have, have might um, suggest having one the evening before and the morning in the start 60 to 90 minutes before you go but you certainly don't need to be doing it for a, for a week in advance or something like that so and I'm sort of saying that you know realistically like electrolytes consumed are probably working through the body and being utilized over a 24 24 kind of 48 hour period they're not hanging around for longer periods where we can build them up that's it because you just pee them out basically um, and it's quite an expensive way to pee out a lot of electrolytes if you're drinking them for, for two weeks before the event thinking you're doing yourself a favour. Um, and the other thing that's important is that drinking lots and lots of water or lots and lots of low strength electrolyte drinks also won't, won't do you a huge amount of good because you can, um, you know, we've all done it. You go to a race, you're a bit nervous, it's hot, everyone's talking about hydration being a big issue. You, everyone's got a two litre water bottle with them and they're swigging away and you, you can get to that stage that we were talking about earlier where you start to dilute your blood sodium levels a little bit and actually you're in a worse place off than when you started doing that so making sure that you keep a lid on the volume of fluid you're drinking increase the sodium content so you retain that that fluid a little bit more effectively and um, you should be in a good place but you certainly don't want to be peeing clear very regularly because you, you've probably overdone it at that point you just okay in relatively normal not bloated um reasonably clear pee but not you know um super clear peeing all the time yeah so is that another way that people can kind of get an idea on how well hydrated they are like the color of their pee yes to some extent um although it is a it is a downstream measure of how hydrated you are because it's the body's always ahead of the game with that because you, you're getting rid of things you don't need at that point so you, you certainly can look at it. You know, if your pee is very dark, then you, you prob it's likely you're dehydrated. So you could maybe do a taking on a little bit of extra fluid. Um, and if your pee is very, very clear and you're peeing way more regularly than normal, then you've probably overdone it with, with fluids. If you're somebody who's quite interested in tracking these things very closely, one of my favorite methods of sort of learning whether you might be dehydrated or not and, and tuning into what your body's telling you is a method called weight, urine and thirst, W-U-T. And what you do at the very first thing you do in the morning is you weigh yourself. So you get your, your morning body weight and normalize that over seven days. So you, you get a bit of fluctuation in there anyway. Yeah. Um, and then you go for your pee in the morning and you, you look at the color and you mark it on a scale of one to three. You either got clear, sort of light or very dark. And then your thirst, not thirsty at all, a little bit thirsty, super thirsty. And if you imagine a Venn diagram of those, those three variables um, and a scenario where your pee is very dark, you're very thirsty and your body weight's down, then almost certainly you're in a situation where you're a bit dehydrated. And at that point, you might choose to have a strong electrolyte drink in the morning before you go training to make sure you're in a good place. Or in some situations in professional sport, you might not train. Yeah, um, and if you do this over a period of time, like some athletes will do this through pre-season um, where loads particularly heavy and they'll track this information and start to learn how they feel when they've got three of those red um, um, circles and also how you feel when, when all of those are good. And then you can hopefully stop having to track that every day and start being more intuitive about 
how you're feeling and what you need to do to to start training that day or, or game day mm. in a good place. Mm. So yeah, I'd cer- certainly you know a quick check of your pee is always uh, it's it's an easy thing to do as well, isn't it? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. With, yeah, coupling that with those subjective markers. Um, yeah. yeah, like you said, learning how to kind of pick up on that naturally up over time of, after a while of tracking is a great great thing to do. So you said that some people might choose not to train if, if they if they really come in dehydrated, but maybe we'd see would someone not be able to just get themselves to that point of hydration in, in an hour or so with with some supplementation? Yeah, potentially. Um, in some in some settings in professional sport. In particularly in the US, um, where workload is exceptionally high, sometimes particularly in pre-season, you've got um, kind of rookies joining joining teams and getting obliterated in training. Um, sometimes where you've got people who have got prevalences for severe muscle cramping or or generating soft tissue injuries and things like that, they might choose just to pull them out of training that morning and rest. Yeah. To, to really recover and hydrate it's it'll be a multi um factorial decision to pull somebody from training but that might play a part in that decision for sure so if so, someone who because obviously you do see people who tend to be more prone to cramp would you yeah. say that that could we couple that in with the higher loss of you know um sodium would those people sit in that category do you think yeah i mean cramp is a massively um misunderstood phenomenon really there's lots of causes for cramp and it's it's not particularly well studied it's a very difficult thing to study well in the lab um, and, and recreate the kind of situations that we see in competition or in training where you get muscle cramps yeah um so subjectively i would say or anecdotally we get a lot of feedback from people who've got very high salt loss or very high fluid loss they take some of our stronger drinks or they do a sweat test online or a proper one try some of the stronger drinks bang no cramps you know they're like blown away by it it happens all the time yeah um but that that's not always the case yes we'd certainly not claim that all cramps are due to electrolyte depletion because they're not and and it's sometimes you have to dig a bit deeper than that if it's not electrolyte depletion or they're coming on very early in an event where you haven't sweat a lot and you've started hydrated then it's likely to be something else um and there's all sorts of things you can you can look at there. There's there's um, the kind of nerve theory around cramping, yeah. and um, um, that that route you can go down. Then we'd also recommend things like some decent soft tissue massage to to work out some of that kind of scar tissue and stuff. If you're getting cramped regularly in the same place, you're not going to be as kind of your muscles aren't going to be as elasticated, and and uh, you, you'll be more prone to cramp in that place again. So maybe working it out with some massage is is a good idea. And yeah. Yeah, electrolytes certainly play a role for some people, but it's definitely not the only thing out there that takes you out. So is this, because obviously, I, I mean, for me, I all, all, the place that I cramp is calf every time. Well, I yeah. don't know why it's the calf, but it's always the calf. Are you, are you saying that potentially, you know, we might see people cramping more often around the site of a little niggle or an injury or somewhere that's potentially tighter, and the driver is that, is the hydration so often the driver could be the hydration strategy is not quite there and then the the occurrence of cramp is potentially around old injuries and weaker muscles things like this exactly that the the, the weakest point is going to go first right so um you, your hydration strategy will, will play a part in that if if it is your fluid electrolytes and depletion of that that's that's the problem but you'll go at the point that's that's weakest and if you're smashing a a particular muscle group doing something and you've you've do have a bit of scar tissue in there or a bit of a niggly injury and things then that can be the the point that really locks up um and grinds you to a halt yeah yeah. pretty horrific so obviously we we spoke about hyponeutremia and i think it's probably worth we are talking about hydration some people might be coming into this and be like oh, okay i need to go and hydrate and as we do with humans we always tend to kind of take things too far and you've already spoken about that the More is from, right you know the advice going from probably low low hydration to people taking it too far and hydrating too much it's probably worth pointing out that like hyponeutremia is extremely dangerous if yeah. left unkept i know 
when I used to and nurse one of our patients. Yeah, it's hyponatremia. Yeah, it is, it's, it's death, isn't it? You know, you can, you can die, ultimately. So yeah. It's definitely something not to be, not to think, oh, I'm just going to drink as much as possible, you definitely. know, because it's definitely a very bad. <laughs> you have to remember that um, if you are competing, the competition is not to, like, take on as much fluid, electrolytes, and other supplementation as possible, which you do see sometimes. Like, some of the, the volume of, of stuff that people try and consume whilst they're, competing at you know in endurance events can sometimes be like you know you got so much to think about here mate what you're actually going to be doing is cracking on you know yeah, um, yeah, whatever, yeah. yeah but the 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 and we talked about overconsumption of sports drinks i think i think it's the same with supplements to some degree as well you know everyone's looking for the the one thing that's going to like um you know send them to the to the to the new pb and stuff and it's it's actually far simpler than that, in my opinion. It's all about good sleeping habits, good eating habits, consistent training, and keeping on top of the macro things. You know, in endurance sport, the, the, the levers you want to pull, you need some fluid, some carbohydrates, and, and some electrolytes. And those, those levers you pull at different degrees in different situations. Um, so certainly, it's not about more is better. Drinking loads and loads and loads of water will do you no good at all. And like you say, it can be exceptionally dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same with, with, with salt, you know, taking on lots and lots of salt. We had a really interesting case a few years ago with a pro tour rider who um, the team doctor at the time um, put everyone on a, a very high salt solution to preload them before uh, each day of the tour. And this was a very small climber. Um, and he started gaining weight. And as a cyclist, a climate cyclist, it's a nightmare putting on two or three kilos. Yeah. And so um, it took him off the supplement and um, his weight normalized and, you know, pretty quickly because he dumped that fluid and, and off he went again. And we, we sweat tested him after that time. And sure enough, he had an exceptionally low salt loss in his sweat and he was just massively overtaken in, in electrolytes. So it's, it, is, it is all about not looking at, you know, the, the best guy in the gym or, or the fastest guy on the bike and say, well, that's what he does. It's going to work for me. Yeah. We have to stop and interrogate what's right for you as an individual and then iterate from that point with some, some intelligent trial and error in training. Because you can start, um, you know, by taking some information that's pretty re readily available and, and put the framework in place. But at the end of the day, you've got to get out there and, and try things out and learn and talk to your coach or talk to the guys at, at PH. We've got sports scientists on the end of email and phone call if you need help, because understanding this is, is the bit is the most interesting bit to get out there and try things, make mistakes where you can make them and learn from them. And that's how you, you get to a plan that works for you uh, most quickly. Yeah. So are there other like kind of health um, issues related to dehydration that people might be aware of or, or, or should look out for? It's a good question, a, a broad question. Um, I think, well, difficult one to answer really because there's there's lots and lots of things out there to, to well, yes and no, basically. There, there are, you, you don't want to be chronically dehydrated because it, it, it's going to affect your cognitive function and you're not going to function particularly well. Mm. But you have to try pretty hard to get um, so severely dehydrated that you, you sort of um, generated any, any kind of medical condition. I certainly don't know of any condition that you would generate from, from getting very dehydrated. Going back to your point about um, hyponatremia deaths, certainly more people die from over drinking than under drinking i don't i'm not sure i'm aware of any reported cases of death by by dehydration per se i guess over the western world obviously it's probably more of an issue in developing countries but we, we've exactly. got pretty good access to water then exactly mm -hmm. so no but there, there are certain conditions that people have where there will be sort of there's more requirement for them to take on on salt or electrolytes um and additional fluid um, but they're they're relatively specific in that um, they'd have, they'll know from their doctor's advice and things that it's something they need to do or, or we would help them with in those cases. So yes or no, you won't develop anything particularly heinous if you're not on, top, on the ball, I'd say. I know um, some of the fighters that I've 
trained, when they've done their rehydration after their weight cuts, have used uh, you guys, your, your, your products. And again, I guess, is this again going to be something where we want to really, rather than just having a one size fits all approach, we, we need to understand kind of how much they're likely to lose, you know, in, in and uh, during that weight cut, how much water and electrolytes they're not they're going to lose, and then how much they can rehydrate with. Yeah, weight cut in sports are fascinating, and I'll definitely caveat this by saying it's it's not my area of expertise, and it is a fine art, as you know. Um, uh, weight cutting successfully and also safely um, because some of the weight cuts you see are unbelievable in terms of the amount of weight that people lose and they yeah. get in the ring and, and get punched in the head. Um, we work with a couple of fighters um, and their coaches um, who who do utilise the products. Yeah, they'll they'll um, take on quite a lot of fluid um, for a, for a period of time and then stop taking on fluid. And pee out a lot of fluid um, because the body takes a while to to sort of catch up, I guess, um, and the timing of that and different supplements that you put into the mix um, through that period is is uh, a fine art mm. uh, at that point. But then, where where we come into play is is the rehydration um, yeah. very quickly, and certainly that's where you'd hit that kind of preloading protocol. Um, to but hit it a bit harder, so you might have a bit more of that fluid because you're replacing a lot more of a, a of a loss before you start, mm. and you'd include some calories in there as well because sure. um, that will certainly increase the absorption rate of that fluid through the gut, having a, a small percentage of carbohydrates in in your fluids as well as that high salt concentration. Mm. Um, but yeah, it is a, it is a fine art mm. cutting before a fight. Funnily enough, actually, what you say about having the calories in the drink as well helps with absorption. I saw a, literally just before I came on this call, uh, a chap called James Nickel, nutrition, nutritionist that I follow, posted a picture, an article about, uh, let me just try and find it, uh, beverage hydration index. And talking yeah. about different beverages that, and different levels of hydration. And it was super interesting, actually. I was, do you, do you know about this kind of index and different beverages kind of hydrating to different yeah. levels? Yeah. So if you if you boil it right back down to kind of layman terms, you can you can split drinks into um, hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic drinks. So um, hypotonic drinks are less concentrated than, than blood. Mm -hmm. Isotonics are allegedly the same concentration as blood, and hypertonics are more concentrated than blood. So, so yeah, and you're referring to sodium concentration? In terms of the concentration of the fluid, because it's got calories in it, it's got salt in it, okay, the yeah. stuff that's in there, the osmolality of the fluid, or tonicity of the fluid. Um, and the amount of, if you boil it right down, the amount of stuff you put in a, in a drink will um, affect how that is moved through the body so if it's if it's hypotonic you've got a concentration gradient to move up there and absorb that fluid into the body mm. now if you if you put a little bit of carbohydrate in there um, around a three percent carbohydrate solution i think is a, is around optimal for absorption through the gut yeah um, you activate a process called sodium glucose co-transport through the gut which basically opens up more channels pull that through and be absorbed into into the blood now the trouble with isotonic drinks and hypertonic drinks from a high from a hydration standpoint i'm going to bracket them together actually because from a labeling standpoint you can uh, and don't quote me on the numbers here i need to go back and look we've got a fantastic blog about the difference between hypotonic isotonic and hypertonic but um you can label a drink as isotonic in quite a, a wide band of um, osmolality or tonicity and quite often that is pretty much a hypertonic drink um, physiologically so what that what that means is that the absorption of that fluid through the gut is is a lot slower because you have to move some fluid uh, across to, to then create a gradient to pull it back into the body right so from a fluid and hydration perspective they're not as optimal but from a fueling perspective, they they would be more optimal um, in terms of delivering calorie, uh, you know, carbohydrates to the body. So you have to think about. I'm actually not a fan at all of, of 
throwing in your hydration and your nutrition into the same bottle because right. it creates inherent um well, it's totally unflexible so for instance if if i had an athlete who was um racing triathlon in the uk where it's pretty cool you can get away with not too much fluid a lot of the time if you're not not a big big sweater and you probably will get away with drinking your calories in that drink because you won't overload the gut if you're drinking 700 600 mil an hour or whatever then if you go and race in a very hot climate your fluid demand might double or even even more than that and if all of your calories are in that bottle as well bang you just overload yourself with calories and you get right huge GI issues and you get sick. So it doesn't give you the ability to pull on one of those levers that we were talking about early, earlier, your fluids, your, your calories or your salt individually and tweak and, and refine as you go. So from a hydration and fueling standpoint, I would much prefer to have access to sort of your, your hydration fluids and salts and your, your calories separately so that you can take more, more fluid and salt on a hotter day and, and uh, a similar amount of, of calories. And if it was cooler, you could dial one down and, and keep the other ones in, um, in the same place. Does that make sense? Otherwise, yeah, yeah. it's the classic, you just get sick and then you've got to slow down to process it, basically. Mm. Okay, so, so trying to keep those two separate, we're not seeing like a more optimal strategy for hydration in terms of, say, using something like orange juice you know, and having kind of some electrolytes within that, added electrolytes within that. Some of it certainly comes down to personal preference. Some people will be able to fuel for endurance events with uh, purely liquid calories and, and li liquid electrolytes. From, from my perspective, it's, more, it's a way more hit and miss approach than separating the two things out. Because, <clears throat> like I say, on those days where you do need more fluid you can you can take more fluid and not take more calories um and that that is the important thing you, you have to be able to react and change on the fly when you're racing in these situations to make sure that you're um you know responding to what what your body is needing at that point you're operating within that framework of a plan but it's a, there's a bit of flex in that because it's never exactly is, is on the hymn sheet when you're out racing yeah sure sure yeah there, there's a place there's a, there's a place for those isotonic sports drinks in in fueling for kind of more intense shorter events i'd say where where taking on solid or semi-solid calories is is difficult but for me um yeah i'm still an advocate of, of splitting them out where you can yeah 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 and so for with that change if you're doing uh different sports say if you're doing you know like we do jiu-jitsu combat sports things like that shorter probably more intense kind of training sessions one to two hours would you, yeah. you have a slightly different approach for that yeah you, you could you could certainly look at utilizing some calorific drinks throughout those bouts and, and see how you get on with those but i think in that situation i'd look at it more holistically and say you know on a competition day for you you, you might fight you know multiple times through the day so looking at what you're doing before you start the day and, and what you're able to take on in between those fights and not feel sluggish and bloated is is probably more important than taking on uh sugary drinks during those bouts i would say and what's the impact on recovery obviously you, you suggest a drink after after the um events is that just literally to top up from what you've lost from the event or is there something is there an impact on how well you're going to recover and adapt from the stimulus that's been imposed yeah as we as we said earlier on you're, you're not going to keep up with your losses through um, a longer period of exercise where you've been sweating a lot. So having um, an electrolyte drink afterwards can be, is topping you up and, and helping you with that recovery process. Now, if, again though, it's a bit like preloading. You don't need to preload before every training session and an event, and you don't need to take on an electrolyte supplement after every training session. But put a little bit of common sense into the mix. If, if, if for instance, you, you're fighting, as we've just used in that example, bouts throughout the day, then you, you want to make sure you're recovering quickly and you're ready to fight again. So you will be having something immediately afterwards to make sure you're, you're set. Mm -hmm. But if, if, like my example earlier, if I was running 10K tonight and I wasn't doing anything tomorrow, and you don't need to be nailing an electrolyte drink after that training session unless you've, you've sweated 
really quite substantially and you've got something else to perform you know you're trying to perform again relatively soon yeah. afterwards um if you're at an event and it's you know you've not got another race for a few weeks or you're, you're backing off training for a while then just get yourself down the beer tent is my usually my advice that's the perfect segue into my next and final question is how <laughs> Is utilising electrolyte supplementation to address hangovers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I've certainly personally seen the benefit. I know you experimented oh. with that at, at university. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I think my key bit of advice there is to make sure you mix it up before you go out because. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll come back to a mess of electrolyte tablets and powders on the side when you wake up in the morning. Um, but no, no, certainly I think uh, dehydration and, and excessive alcohol intake is, is, is not, uh, well, it's, it's relatively obviously linked. So making sure that you're uh, helping the body rehydrate can certainly help a little bit with those kind of things. But uh, we always, Henry, advocate drinking responsibly both with always. And <laughs> always always so Johnny, that, that's been super interesting um where can if people want to learn more about hydration and you guys and want to kind of take your online sweat test and things like that where can people get hold of you yeah for sure just head to precisionhydration.com um and our sweat test is is in the header you can see it just says free hydration plan hit that run through the questions and you, you'll get a um, a, a, a plan sent to you on email you can either reply to those emails or um, ping us at hello at precisionhydration.com and somebody will, will get back to you usually within a day and, and we love to chat so if you've got any questions then then ping us a note great stuff have you got have you got anything coming up wise i know sometimes you do kind of endurance events and different bits and bobs i guess at the moment the calendars are a bit messed yeah, up it's looking, like, it's looking like most things are going to be cancelled this year um, so just ticking over really um, I've been, been getting out on the bike a little bit and uh, doing a little bit of running but not not a huge amount a bit of paddling actually on the sea down here so yeah just just ticking over mate really um, trying to try not try not get fat basically <laughs> that's the battle well look thanks for joining us Johnny really enjoyed having you on it was great catching up and uh, yeah we'll, we'll have a chat soon yeah it's great to speak to you cheers mate cheers all right guys that was uh, really fun for me to catch up with uh, johnny talk about a subject that he knows really well um you know like some of our previous episodes about sleep and nutrition hydration is something that really affects us all and you know further kind of um optimizing your your hydration is going to have a big impact on your performance and your recovery from training so hopefully there's some some things in there that you can start actioning um to to kind of create a bit of a strategy for to, to input into your own life um that, that that's actually the last podcast we're going to record for a while now uh let's call that the end of season one if you like um i thought 10 episodes would be a great place to finish for a while as we switch our attention to other aspects of the business uh, but this is certainly something that we're going to come back to and, and do a season two uh, with another 10 episodes and we'll be working on getting some more great guests uh, for that season and to talk about different aspects of kind of health wellness nutrition training and all that sort of stuff so really appreciate all of you who've been tuning in and listening week after week um, you know it's it's great to be able to just put some amazing people in this in this industry and in these fields in front of you and uh, the people that I kind of you know pay a lot of attention to and to kind of get you guys listening to them as well so it's been a real great honor for me to be able to speak to a lot of these guys and I hope you've uh, enjoyed the episode um, as I said like comment and share because it really helps us to be able to to do more things like this and it will help us to be able to get some great guests on our next season and keep listening re-listen to old episodes I'm sure you'll pick up different stuff when you listen, you know, the second or third time. And I'll see you guys all soon.